Father, I want to thank you so much and from our family. When I say our family, I mean this earthly family. Beholding your face and your love, we worship you today. And we invite you into our presence that you would be in this kitchen, you would be in this home, as much as we pray you are in any church, in everyone's home, and in everybody's heart. Thank you, Lord. And I pray and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All righty, Daddy. We're making sweet potato flatbread. You really do only need two ingredients. The third one that we're going to be using is optional, but your two basic ingredients, it boils down to, no pun intended, any kind of flour and a sweet potato. A white potato will not work. It's a different nature. Even though it's a starch, it's not going to work the way you want it to. And it's not going to taste the same way because our bread is not going to be super sweet, but it's going to just have that hint of sweet that allows you to enjoy whatever you're going to put on that sandwich. Because did you know that pretty much any and every bread that you get, it's got a boatload of sugar in it. So you're actually eating it for that flavor too. But God already built it in when he made the sweet potato itself. So we're going to use, you know, our favorite go-to flour that we use around here because we want to be gluten-free, want to be affordable and healthy, oat flour. All we did is we took some regular oats and you went and grind them up in a blender and you pour it. We actually store it in our refrigerator. Keep it fresh, keep it cool, and it's gone for weeks at a time and had no impact or whatsoever. So we got our oat flour that we've ground up ourselves, but I'm gonna show you how to process the sweet potato because we have some potatoes that are already ready to go. Now, there is one other ingredient I realized I did not bring it out, and that is one of the stars on our flavor show. That is salt. And we like to use pink Himalayan salt. So these are really your ingredients as far as what you need to cook. And then these are your additives, Himalayan salt and some extra virgin olive oil. This is optional because you may be trying to go for a no oil bread. It works pretty much the same, but I like to use it for texture wise, a little bit easier to work with. And when it fries up, because that's what we're actually going to do, we're going to put it on a low fry to make the bread. It gives it a nice little uh, touch that allows it to crisp up just a little bit more. So let's start with our two main ingredients. We've already ground up our flour. And so what you're going to do, you're going to need a mixing bowl. We're going to take our mixing bowl and we're going to go and you need two and three cups, excuse me, two and one third cup of oat flour. OK, so we're going to go ahead again, whatever flour you use will work. But we recommend this one and we're going to add our two cups. So we got cup number one and cup number two. And now we're going to get that extra one third cup of flour, all right? Two and one third cup of flour done. If you ever want to see how to process that, just do a search. Matter of fact, I'll put it on the link here on this video if you're watching on YouTube, the link to when we show you how to make your own oat flour. But all we did was take your regular oatmeal. I think we actually used quick oats this time, but you can use, uh, we, I like to use personally, I like to use um, the old fashioned oats. But our blender is not quite up to par. By God's grace, we're eventually going to get that Vitamix. That's going to be a really cool thing. Uh, but until that time, the Lord blesses us that way. Um, we'll use our blender and uh, it grates up just fine to make your own flour. You don't have to buy bag flour anymore at the store. All right. So now we're going to go ahead, set this to our side. And now we're going to process our sweet potatoes. When it comes to working with the sweet potatoes, you only need two cups. So for two one third cup of flour, two cups of mashed sweet potatoes. So when I'm making the sweet potatoes, obviously you gotta skin them. You cannot eat these with skin on. So what I like to do is just take a peeler here, get the skin off. Now, if you don't peel off the ends, you can cut those off with a knife, get all the pins, okay? So one end I could peel with the knife, no problem. But this other one, it's a little bit wide. I actually got it. You got a good um, good peeler. You don't really have to cut it. But you can also just go here and here in the beginning and then do your peeling if your peeler is not quite as sharp as this one. Okay? So now that's how you want to process the potato. But we've already taken the time to do two of them ahead of time. So we've cut these up. And how to get your cup, I like to do it beforehand. So I cut like this. And then as I'm cutting up my slices to figure out, you know, do I have enough? You know, I don't want to guess when I'm boiling. I just take those slices and I literally set them inside the cup. So that way I know I'm on the mark and I'm just cutting these 
about this width. You know, they have to be as thin as a quarter, but we don't want them to take forever. Remember, the thicker you cut, the longer it's going to take for those to bake, excuse me, to boil up. So thin enough to boil, and that's one cup. Because remember, when we mash it, you mush it, it's you know going to compress. So that's about what you want. A heaping cup of raw, you need two of those. You're going to take those, you're going to put them on a boil, and you're going to boil them until they're soft, all right? And that's that. So we have some already boiled up for us. So let's go ahead and get those. While I'm dealing with these, I'm going to be warming up our pan. We are frying these, but remember, you don't need any oil. We're frying these on a low fry. And so you're pretty much, you're essentially baking them on an oven. All right, that's pretty cool. So no oil needed. This is just a ceramic griddle, something that's nice and flat because that's what we're gonna do with our breads. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back on. Let this stay warm. So that'll be ready to go for us. Now, we've taken our potatoes already beforehand. We've boiled them just in some simple water. Now we're gonna go ahead and strain all of the water away. So we're gonna take our strainer, we're gonna pour our potatoes in. So we're getting rid of all that water, all the extra water, but we want that moisture that's in there because that's gonna go ahead and mix in with our potatoes. So now we're gonna take our potatoes from our strainer, put them back in our pot. This is a little hot, so let me get a nice cover here. There we go. Now. Other thing you're going to need to mash these, if you want to, you can just take a knife or you can take a fork, even a spoon, and just go after it and mash it if you want to. Or you can get a masher. Depends up to you. And even if you want to put them in a blender, you can do that too. They don't have to be whipped to uh, whip pudding consistency, but they just have to be broken down so they mix, mixes in with our flour. So I'm going to go ahead and mash these up. I'm going to turn up the pan so you can see them. I'm going to move this around. And what happens if you go ahead and you mash these up and when you put in the two cups, you realize, oh, I don't have quite enough. Just cut back on the flour. Or if you got some potatoes left over, just boil up a couple of more. It doesn't take that long for things to boil. But I didn't want us to be waiting too long. So I said, let me go on ahead and get this done ahead of time. All right. So we needed two cups of these mashed. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my one third. So I need six of these for all you math wizards at home. And I might be a hair short. Got about five or four there. And now I'm going to take a spoon and I'm going to scoop that out. So all we've done is we mashed our potatoes. It doesn't take a lot of arm strength to do that if you boil them enough. And we're going to go ahead and put all of that into the flour. Should have gotten a wood spoon. Sorry for that screeching sound. Uh, no screeching on the Sabbath. <laughs> All right. So here we go. So we have our flour and potato puree ready to go. But a couple of things to give it a little flavor, to bring out the flavor of that potato and the flour and vice versa. We're going to put salt in. We're going to take one teaspoon of our pink Himalayan salt, and we're just going to make sure that's all over. So that's evenly spread. In fact, where I'm thinking about it, I probably should have put the salt in into the flour and mingled that on its own. That helps the flour to get in that salt mixed in even better. So that's another tip for you who are watching this on the replay, but we're going to go forward. Now that we got our sweet potatoes, we got the flour and the salt. Remember, this is an optional situation. You do not have to put any oil into uh, this mix. I just like to do that personally so that I can know I have that flour a little bit easier uh, to work with. But a cool thing about doing gluten-free baking, whenever you're working with flour, you don't have to worry about any fight in the flour because there's no gluten. When actually you're usually kneading something or pushing dough, what's pushing back, you're creating that gluten protein. And that's why that bread or that dough becomes tough. But when you have a gluten-free flour, your bread is going to be really easy to work with. That's why anybody can mash this up. It's an ideal bread to make together as a family. You know, sometimes we'll have the girls, uh, Jayal and I think the last time we made it, we were in here working on it and playing in it together. So it's an easy bread to make. It's a fun one to make, but it's even better to eat. Now all we have to do is mix it. We got our flour together, and I usually start off with a spoon because eventually we are going to get our hands in the game. 
because what will usually happen is the flour will clump up around the uh, sweet potato. But once it's gotten wet, it kind of makes the shield right around or away from the rest of the flour. So now we got to get in there and we got to got to struggle for the soul a little bit, <laughs> but it's not hard. All I'm doing, I'm just taking my hands now and I'm just mashing them together. OK, I'm mashing the flour and the sweet potatoes together and make sure I get it all off of the spoon here. You do want to be careful. It won't kick up into this huge cloud of dust, but it will spill on the counter. And if you're like me, I like to cook clean. So that'll kind of get on your nerves. So just go ahead and give it a nice, gentle massage. When it's cold, like it's been recently, this has been really fun to make. Just to feel this warm dough on your hands. It's like Play-Doh with a heater in it. So <laughs> it's really fun to make. All right, so now what I'm doing, I've got all of the flour and the potato puree pretty much integrated. So this is what we have right now. And so I want to get all of the flour. I don't want anything left behind. So when I see a wet spot on the flour ball or the dough ball, I just touch the, the dough, excuse me, touch the dough ball to that flour and pick it up. And I'm really just really doing a turning and mashing motion. So we make sure you see that. I'm turning it over and I'm mashing, turning over, mashing. Totally different than if we were working with the gluten bread. It's not pushing back on me. It's not fighting me. So think about it. If I'm making this, it's gluten free. It's not pushing back on me. It's not fighting me. When it goes in here, it's not going to push back on me. It's not fighting me. And so this is why this is a great bread to add. If you're especially starting out trying to go gluten free and experiment, you don't have to spend five or six dollars for a loaf of bread especially for something that's going to be on a flat bread. You can make it all on your own and it won't push back on you and it's not going to fight you. All righty. So our dough ball is about complete. So I think I'm ready to show this off. I think it's pretty enough now. And now we're ready to move from the bowl to the table. Now, when you're working with a surface, everybody's kitchen is different. It's great if you've got a marble countertop or if you've got uh, some other kind of stone countertop. Um, but just as long as this is flat, dry surface, it'll be fine. So we don't have marble and this works well enough for us here. And so we've got our dough ball and you can see we're able to move it. It's not fighting us, but it's not falling apart. So we got a good moisture in there and we've got our sweet potato. Oh, mixed in. All right. Now, some people like to put flour on the counter, depending again on your countertop, you may or may not have to do it. Whatever works for you, right? So what we're going to do is going to get all these things out of the way so you can really focus on the pin action. Now we're going to actually make the flat bread. We're going to take these balls that we break off of our big dough ball and we're going to flatten those out. And then that's what you're going to go ahead and just fry. I say that fry uh, on the surface for a good minute on each side. In two minutes, we're going to have slices of bread right here. So depending on how big you want yours to be, if you want to make a mega size one, hey, you want to make this a pizza crust, you'll take this whole ball, mash it out into a circle, bake it, and then, or fry it if you have a big enough griddle, and then you go ahead, top it with your pizza, bake the toppings, and you got a pizza crust. We're not going to use it as a pizza crust. What can you make with this? If you're thinking about tortillas, I know when I was especially trying to get more gluten-free um, uh, in my diet, tortillas were, that was like the first thing I went to. It was affordable and they were gluten-free. But over time, I actually saw it. I was starting to have difficulty dealing with those. And they just didn't have the same flavor as this bread. You can use it if you have a pita sandwich. So if you're using it to make a sandwich, you got some lettuce, you got some uh, some onions, tomatoes, avocado, and whatever other kind of you know plant-based meat you want to put on there, you can put that on there to make the sandwich. All of the, the thickness of your uh, bread is going to depend on how thin you decide to make it. So we're going to make ours probably on the thin side because we're using them to replace like a tortilla. But if you want it to be thicker, all you have to do is make a bigger ball. So I'm going to make some small like tortilla thin. And I'll do some other ones that are kind of like pita thin. Pita tortilla. Pita tortilla. I want to learn Spanish. I will. Until then, that's about as far as it goes for me. <laughs> tortilla. Pita is not Spanish. I'm not sure what pita is. 
If anybody knows what PETA is, send in a comment. That'd be cool to find out. So we're making our balls here. All you see me doing is I'm just breaking it off of the big ball of dough and I'm making smaller ones. I'm rolling them up. They don't have to be airtight cylindrical circles because ultimately when I mash them out, they're going to you know, they're going to take some crazy shapes anyway. So how many you get from a ball of loaf or, you know, just from this one recipe, it all depends on how much you use. I know on average, we can get a good 12 or 15 out of a single ball. So you think about a slice of bread, right? Okay. If I can get 12 or 14 out of it, that's about five or seven sandwiches. That's not bad. And so if you make a bigger batch, a little more flour, a little more sweet potatoes, you can make some bread. And the really beautiful thing about these breads, they do not go bad. There's no dairy in it, so it's not going to spoil. You're not going to necessarily mold as quick as like you would with a regular bread because we are frying it up. So it's just got so many benefits. In fact, I think it's like one of the oldest breads that um, we've had since the beginning of time. So who knows? Maybe Moses made some of this. No, they had manna. So they didn't have to make. Maybe Abraham. Maybe Abraham. Yeah. Maybe they had some when they had Jesus and the angels over for dinner. Sarah whipped up some of this so they could have some bread to eat with their meat. Okay. And we're rolling, rolling, rolling. And I'm doing a quick ball count. Don't have my sous chefs here today. They're all good. They're here. We're worshiping. We're all happy. But they said, no, we're going to watch this one because I'm hoping they watch really good because I want them to be able to make this bread too. But we're making this. So I don't have my sous chefs to count how many we have here. But it looks like, whoa, we are maxing out two. Oh, we've got three, six, nine, 12, 15. We're up to 18, 18. I made these kind of small. So like I said, you can get anywhere from 12 and it looks like we might get up to 21. I'm trying to make an even number. Because like I said, if you're making this it's for sandwiches, you're going to have you know one on each side or a slice for each one. Or you can use it as a pita where it's flat and uh, you put your toppings on it. Roll it up, yum it up and eat them. So this is a lot easier than making like a cornbread or some other kinds of breads that you might be intimidated with if you're a beginner baker. This is a good one to start out with. All right. So I'm getting up all the scraps. We don't leave anything behind. We like Jesus said, we don't leave any fragments behind. No food left behind. All right. So it looks like we've got what? Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, four. We got 26. All right. So ideally, depending on how small these roll out, they get too small. I'll mash them up together. We got 26. About to say we had the 24 elders. Now I've got this pan. It's got a nice warmth to it. I'm putting my hand over. I can actually feel the heat. Right. So I know that when I put these on there, they're going to work really well. So let's turn this into a flatbread. You're going to take your ball. You don't have to worry about putting a bunch of flour, oil, you don't want to put oil, anything on your uh, rolling pin. So it can be as large as this one, even if you have a smaller one. If you have to, you can use a can. Just take the paper off, use a nice little can, and you're going to press it down on top of your bread, and you're just going to walk it out. So I'm just taking my hand, walking it out. I'm not trying to make it look like a perfect circle. It's going to be difficult to do that. And so, one, I don't really care when I'm eating the sandwich. And two, I'm looking more at the thickness of it than the circumference of it. But if you want to make it pretty, all you have to do, take your hands and walk around the end of your flatbread and you'll make it into a nice, pretty circle. So I leave that up to you. I eat with our eyes, right? We eat with our eyes first, right? But at the end of the day, we eat it with our mouth. <laughs> so we want it to be pretty and we want to keep it pretty simple. So now once we've gotten one done, I like to usually work ahead of time so to make it easy, depending on your surface, I take a flat spatula, and as you just saw, I just walked it around, and I sat it there on the table. It's a clean surface, it's dry, and now I can pick it up easily, and I can fry it up even easier. So I'm going to make a few of these. I'm not going to take the time today and our whole time that we have together, but I'm going to make a few of them so that you can see how easy it is. You, all you need is a nonstick pan. In fact, I had to use this one because Tara said the other one that we had wasn't very pretty. So um, I had to use this one, but I normally use a smaller. I don't like to have a whole bunch of nonstick pans around. I like having.
or frying situation, that would be ideal. And fortunately, they're pretty affordable for what you would spend somewhere else. So see, this one was kind of small and I'm not going to get a lot of surface. So I took another small one and I'm just mashing it together. OK, so anytime you see those are too small, I, I need them bigger. Just mash these together. Like I said, it can be as big as a pizza or as small as a cracker. It's totally up to you. But it's not going to be crunchy like a cracker. I don't want a cracker bread. I don't want it to be hard. Just want it to be firm. All right. And it's kind of fun too when you're making your shapes. Sometimes you get like a shape like this. Almost looks like a heart. Almost. Accidentally. Last one. I'm going to make our fiver and I'll leave the rest here to do a little bit later. All right. So these are small. Let me know if you want to make them a little bigger. I'm going to go ahead and make one a little bit larger. And this is amazing how soft it is, how easy it is to work with this dough. Because remember, if it's easy to work with and it's easy to eat, it's going to be easy on your body, giving you what you need, not what you don't. All right. So now it's amazing how when it comes to making healthy food, every part of the process is just a natural there's a piece to it. We were talking about that today in our study. So I got five here. And this one's a little bit larger, like so, about the size of my hand. This one here is a little bit smaller, see, a little bit smaller. So totally up to you. And this is our thickness. The thickness, that's what we're looking for. I don't know if you can catch that. That's tough to see on the camera, but I think you can see it right there. You see that thickness? That's about what you want. You can make it thicker, you can make it thinner. As long as you can get it up off your counter, you'll be good. All right, so now let's get to frying. Because we have a larger, this is really more like a griddle, I can put a couple of these on at one time. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take this first one that we did. All you have to do, no need to spray any oil on here. This is a nonstick. As long as it's a nonstick surface, you don't have to spray anything there. I'm gonna go ahead, just drop that there. And then put this one here. And I'm going to put this last one here. If you don't have a separate timer, you can use a timer on your microwave. Or if you do have a timer, but you don't know where you put it, <laughs> you stay with the microwave or you get your cell phone. Bada squash. Thank you. Here's our timer. Thank you, sweet. I don't know if y'all heard Tara. She told me where it was. She always knows where I need to be. All right, so now this is one minute. So now we got one minute. You just let that cook on one side. You don't have to move it around, but you can. I don't know if you can pick this up on camera, but it's actually starting to, you know, you see it steaming up. We don't want it smoking. We don't want it burning. If we let that sit right, if we got that, and our, our heat, by the way, is at medium heat. So just between medium and medium high. Do not put it on high. It will burn. Do not put it on low. You'll be standing there forever. So put it on about medium to medium high heat on your regular stove top, okay? So we're gonna let that go for a minute. I know this is a no-no, but I'm gonna take this metal spatula on this nonstick. And you really, I'm not gonna be, there's our minute. I'm not gonna be scraping. I'm just trying to get my hand under there. And if it's that nonstick, I can literally take my hand right there and I'm just flipping it over. Flipping it over. And I'm just cooking it on the other side for one minute. Now, if you want it a little bit more crispy, I will like, you know, sometimes I'll add a minute. I'll make it like two minutes. So I'm going to do that one for a minute and I'll do this one for two minutes. See if there's a difference. And um, you'll just see it browning up a little bit on the edges and in the middle. But you should never be completely browned. And it really shouldn't just be all, you know, looking like this either. But that's all it is. That's it. This bread will last for weeks in the refrigerator. And it'll last for months in the freezer. It really is an ideal bread to make and to have. So you can make a whole bunch of them in bulk, keep it in there for months at a time in the freezer. All you got to do when you take it out the freezer, just thaw it out, or you take it out of the freezer, put it right in the oven, warm it up, or right in the microwave. You got your sandwich bread right there. It's beautiful. Sweet potatoes, flour, salt, done. A little oil if you want to. Some people may want a flavor there. They say, well, you know, I want to put a little flavor to it. If you want to make more of a savory kind of uh, flatbread, that's when you put a little garlic, maybe some onion powder, a little bit of uh, basil. And then if you're trying to make something that's on the sweeter side, 
then maybe you might want to add some sugar. And then you would put some sugar in there and then you could put your toppings. It's just so versatile. I rather leave the flavor to what I put on the bread, but you know, have some fun with it. Try that and let us know how, if you made the actual flavored bread, right? You can't do that in most places. All right, so I tried this second side for two minutes. I'm gonna take a peek at them, make sure, okay, yeah, they're gonna look good, they're gonna look good. So I got just 30 more seconds left on that side. And I'm gonna show you, and we're going to taste them. Oh, I guess, I don't know if we should taste them now. Should we wait till after the message? That kind of gives me some incentive. So while we're waiting those last 30 seconds, remember we're rolling these out. You don't even really need to hold the ends of the rolling pin. It's not that dramatic, but I'm just gonna have these here and make some good old fashioned flatbread. All right, we're gonna like 10 more seconds and we're gonna see how these came out. And this one's so tiny. If you mess up, you don't like the way it looks, you take it, <laughs> ball it back up, start over again. That's what's really cool about the bread. All right, so now I'm gonna stop here because the timer went off. Let's see what we got over here, okay? Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Let me show you how these look here. I think this is the first one we put on there. See how we have it browning on the edges and it'll brown a little bit in the center, but mm, it smells so good. It's not as hard. It's not brittle like a cornbread because remember we put those sweet potatoes in there. So the, the, the sweet and soft just gives it a really nice texture. So it's not hard, it's not crunchy, but at the same time, it's not mushy. It's just, it's just right. <laughs> okay, so now we've made these up and I'm gonna stop here, okay? Because I think you get the idea. We'll try some a little bit later on camera, maybe if I remember <laughs> at the end of our, uh, our study time, but that's how you make sweet potato flatbed. Flour, sweet potato, salt, and oil if you want it, on a stove, one minute to two minutes on each side, they're ready to eat, and you can last for months in your freezer. Hope y'all enjoyed that. Hope you make some, because it's hard to go buy some. I don't think you can find any of this in the grocery store, but don't worry about it. Now you know how to find it in your own kitchen. So as you